So I'll be doing the talk in English, but if you want to talk Dutch, kan ook gewoon Nederlands spreken, maar voor de gemakzucht zullen we Engels kiezen. So this talk is why open source technologies should be using open source. Um, so in in the idea that we are here people who use open source, sometimes our companies do not make the same choices of using open source. Um, I had, I was lucky enough to actually migrate one um, organization and then after that I had more examples. Um, so I'll be going through some of the um, pains and, and knowledge I, I gained through that experience. So who am I? Um, I'm from Belgium. Um, I have my company uh, all in open source and we do a whole bunch of uh, projects we help out on many things uh, like Chris said I also help organize some conferences um, so we have conflict management camp after FOSDEM we'll have load days which will be middle of next year um, and then I'm also part of the Open Power Foundation which is part of the example I'll be giving later um, so we became a member I then became the technical steering committee chair um, and I had a lot of pain when I became that and so I tried to solve some of these issues. One of the issues was that as the foundation, as it's called an open power foundation, which wants to build open source, was not actually using any open source internally. So we, we decided after a lot of discussions to migrate to, to a fully open source stack, um, and we were able to do that, uh, which is why I can give this presentation. So yeah, so I'll do a small, short introduction. I presume everybody knows most of the introduction, but I'm still going to do it. Um, I'll be showing the use case we had, what we achieved at the end, um, and a small conclusion about how you can do similar things um, in a very easy and um, ev evolutionary way. So you don't need to have a revolution in the company. You can evolve over time. Uh, because for certain companies, it's just not possible to build it all over again. So the introduction, open source, um, these are the Wikipedia uh, definitions. But for us, the most important things is we have license models which are open. This means that the open source code is freely available. Um, and that code is to distribute. Uh, we have to like Git or like other public access tools that enable us to do this. Um, and then we have the connectivity and the internet that makes it easy to collaborate with each other uh, over vast distances. Um, if you saw the NLNet presentation, they are actually funding some of these things. Um, uh, Michiel gave an example that Vivado is a software which costs you a few million euros. Um, so if you wanted to build something with Vivado, it's, it's very costly. Uh, in an open source model, we can do that in a more easier way, a free way, and that makes it accessible to people who typically do not have that kind of money. Um, and that's one of the other things that is important, yes? You don't care about uh, copyleft versus permissive I will come back if you give me a minute. Okay. <laughs> so this is the, the main idea between, uh, behind open source. So in my opinion, there is open source, open source, and open core. And this comes back to your question. Um, I see open source as in the permissive open source, which is the more uh, Apache, MIT, BSD type of licenses. And this is just names. I mean, there are many more than these. I didn't list all the licenses model uh, here. Uh, but in a permissive license, you get access to the code and you can do whatever you want with it. Typically, big companies like this because they can then package that open source code and try to give you that in a more proprietary way. Um, and this is what happened with some of the Unixes. Um, Unix is open source, but HP Unix, AIX, uh, Solaris were not open source. So they made modifications. They did not have to publish this to anyone. They did not have to explain their actions to anyone, um, which is why permissive licenses are liked by those type of companies. Um, typically, you have the more viral open source or the more copy left um, where if you make changes you need to publish your changes. Um, now you have GPL 
which is a very well-known one. You have AGPL, um, but you also have MPL and EU EPL. Um, but again, these are licenses like the um, Linux kernel, which require you that if you make a change to the code, you publish it. Um, if you try to package this into something, you need to make the end user aware that you have packaged this. And if you make any changes, again, you need to publish those changes. So those are the, the open source uh, licenses. I typically divide them into. Um, personally, I have no problem with any of these two. You may be a fan of one or the other, but that's personal preference, I think. Um, I will not be going into more detail. For me, when I talk about open source, I talk about all of these first two license models. Open Core is a different model. These are packages that try to portray themselves as open source. And the code is open source. We cannot deny that. But some of the features that you would want are not open source. And that's where the, the core comes in. So they have, uh, for instance, they don't have support by default for maybe LDAP, or they don't have support for uh, single sign-on, or this uh, interaction feature might not be available. And if you want those features, you need to go to a proprietary license. Um, open core, crippleware, whatever you want to call it. But this is what we should avoid. These are people who try to hijack the open source mentality. Um, and there are many companies like this. Um, again, I understand sometimes why they do it, because they need to make money. Uh, but it's not always the best approach. There are better ways of, of trying to solve that problem. Uh, which is why in the, in the previous presentation, uh, Chris, for instance, spoke about Elastic and open search. This is part of this model and this problem. Um, then there's also the, the one that I don't mention here because it's not really open source, which is the business uh, source license, or like we like to call it the bullshit license, but I don't mention that because it's not open source. So what do we want? Open source everywhere. To, to software, which is why my talk is not the open source software everywhere. We want open source everywhere. Um, again, if you saw the talk of Michiel, he talks about how they are enabling hardware, and this is some part that we want to do also. Um, so we want hardware that is open, that, that you can actually design uh, yourself, that you can see the, the schematics, that you can understand the firmware, and everything be open and available to the public. Uh, there are these three uh, organizations I know of. Maybe there are more than this, I'm not denying that. Uh, open Compute Project. Um, which is very active in doing that. Uh, they are trying to get large manufacturers to build standard designs. Uh, one of their successes is the OCP NIC. So that's a standard design that now is available on all manufacturers. Before you had Medzian connectors, where, which meant that you had proprietary connectors for each manufacturer. Now you have a standard uh, which is fully open. You have Chips Alliance. Um, that is trying to make more the, the chip designing open source and the whole how do you build chips and how do you design them. Um, again, coming back to the example of uh, Michiel, he spoke about Vivado, uh, which cost you a few million euros. If you use the chip designs uh, tooling like Edelize, uh, FuseSoc, um, or LibreSoc, actually use fully open source tooling to create your own little chip and your own little CPU if you wanted to. Um, and one is Open Power Foundation, um, which is more about the whole power ecosystem, which over time has been open sourced. Um, so they now have fully open source hardware, which is available and you can actually use yourself. So the problem is, I mean, most of us will know Linux and the kernel. It was using BitKeeper which was a proprietary software for doing version control. They had a, a, a free license uh, till one day they decided to revoke that. And at that point, Linus Stovall wrote Git. And today most of us use Git. Uh, Git is fully open source. We can use this, we can use the whole variety of tooling around that. The whole kernel today uses this tooling to communicate and to advance their uh, the, the Linux kernel. 
the other problem is GitHub as the open source Git tool. Now, if you think that GitHub is a good solution for you to host your code on, then you have a problem. Um, there, the example here is YouTube download, um, which got banned from GitHub because of a DMCA violation, if I remember well. Um, I think about a month later, GitHub apologized and said that there was a mistake. But basically, they have denied projects, they have denied people access. This is not the way we should be working in open source. So I can understand that people first look at GitHub, and maybe your project should be available on GitHub. And I'm not denying that part of it, because people are stupid and people click GitHub and they think GitHub is the only Git in the world. And we should make it available for them, but we should make them also aware that this is just a mirror or this is just for publicity. Please come to our Git repository where you have full access and full availability. And then, which, which disturbs me personally a lot, is people who use Slack and who think that Slack is, a, is an open source messaging tool. Um, and then you have uh, a specific uh, uh, foundation, another one, with a, with a to-do uh, grouping, which is about open source ecosystem. And if you want to see what happens there, you need to join their Slack channel, which doesn't make sense. I mean, if you're going to talk about open source, please do not use these type of tools. They are good for other people, but not for us, maybe. Teams is another example. Um, OAuth is another example. Um, um, and then you have people who like to use like Excel or Google Docs. Um, and I'm giving these examples because these will come back later. Um, we have using FrameMaker to do documentation. Now, if you want to do documentation with an open source community, you do not use a proprietary tool. This is not going to advance you. People need to buy it. They are not going to be interested in buying it or contributing to you. If you have platforms like Blackboard, um, this is not going to help you for education or for anything else. Also, it looks very bad that you're using proprietary tools and trying to sell an open source message. Um, and by the way, this is what part of the Linux Foundation was also doing. Sorry? Was. was yeah. Uh, as far as my knowledge goes, they are migrating to a platform which is similar to what we did in the Open Power Foundation uh, because the Open Power Foundation is under the Linux Foundation, so they are trying to copy our model. Um, but as far as I know, it hasn't been implemented or it might be implemented. I, I'm not up to date on that. Yes, Marcel? Um, how do you look at um, uh, feature comparison? So I can imagine that there is an open source tool Yep. That is not mature at this point in time, and there is a proprietary tool that is mature for a given situation. So that's that's a better choice when you look at the problem you need to solve in your specific case. How, how do you look at? It? I see it as an option that you use a proprietary tool. Now, you start working on the open source tool. We as developers, as operation people, can contribute, can help out these tools to become mature, and then replace them. Um, which is why you will see in my solution I talk about components and, and uh, little parts of software that we use so that if you need to have a more proprietary tool or maybe you didn't know the open source tool existed, you can over time migrate. So yeah, we need to use open source. Uh, we cannot be just evangelizing open source and then using proprietary uh, tools behind it. Um, I like the fact that when you go to Linux conferences, people boot up Windows machines or Macs. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but they boot it on an Intel processor. So where do you where, where do you draw the line? The, the line? Yeah. We draw the line at what we can do now. If we can already run 100% open source software, then we should be doing that. We should be going to the next step in producing open source hardware, and we want to do that and we should be working towards that. I'm not saying this is the perfect solution. I'm not saying there is a perfect solution. I'm just saying that if we can already do those parts, why not do them now already? Why wait till the full stack is there? I understand that we need to build the full stack. It isn't there today. But we need to start working towards that. 
So yeah, the case that I will be uh, talking about um, is the foundation. It's about 300 members. Um, they have different working groups. Um, each working group is divided into private, uh, which are for specific members. Then all the members can go to member working groups. And then there was a provision to have public working groups. But till I came, they, they never existed, um, which is why they never actually had a problem um, till we started instantiating these public working groups. Um, so new leadership in 2019, they wanted to be more, uh, more uh, product driven. They wanted to have more software uh, involvement um, and they wanted to have interaction with the community. Um, because previously it was more specification driven. Um, the specifications were built in, in closed source tools because it was done by companies who didn't care about that. Today, and the change of leadership made the whole of this thought process on, on how do we interact, how do we change our way of working, how do we become more open ourselves. So the goal was to create an open ecosystem. If you want to create an open ecosystem, you should be using open tooling. Um, you still need to create specification and documentation because this is what hardware manufacturers need, otherwise they will not produce it. Um, so sometimes when you want to produce stuff, you don't produce it actually yourself. You have a, a factory build it, so you need to give them specifications, they will build it for you. Um, reference designs which are open so that people can actually see beforehand what they are going to get. Um, and then yeah, we wanted to be more developer community and academic community focused, which meant that we needed to have interactions with people who are used to using open source tooling, but also who are used to having more open communication. They're not going to subscribe to be able to communicate. They just want to talk with somebody, solve their problem, and go on to the next stuff. Some of the things that happened there was the ISA got open sourced, um, the architecture got open sourced. Um, there were all these interactions that we wanted to have make sure that the, the foundation actually runs on these power machines because at the end of the day if you're trying to sell a machine and you can't even prove that you can run yourself on it then it doesn't look very good. Um, and for the people who know the history of power it's not just enterprise machines like previously so they do have machinery that is slightly more affordable. Yeah it's still expensive but it's not it doesn't cost you an arm and a leg anymore. Um, so yeah, the entire system needs to be fully open sourced from the hardware perspective. The firmware got open sourced in 2014. Um, so the, you can go actually on GitHub and see the entire uh, firmware. You can even go to each manufacturer and the manufacturer is required to publish it on their own or at least in, in the GitHub repository. Um, so that you can see even the specifications and the VPDs uh, of what is in the system. Um, so, Boot, which is actively under development, um, so uh, they are they are able to semi IPL a machine already. Um, presumably by mid next year, it will be fully available. Um, the BMC software, so Open BMC, which is today available on multiple of hardware was open sourced in 2015. The ISA itself is now also open source, so that's 2019. And then we have Libre BMC, which is the newest project, which is an open source BMC hardware. So it's an actual card that you can put in. It's a fully programmable FPGA, so you can run whatever you want on it. Uh, we do have reference uh, designs, where you could program and put your own car there. That can be a power car, that could be a RISC 5 car, or that can be an ARM car if you really wanted to. Like I said, there are several machines that are actually IBM and a few uh, Inspur, um, Winstron actually make machines which you can buy where you can have full access to everything, every binary blob that is there. Um, you can reproduce them all yourself, which is what Raptor, for instance, does. They give you the full specifications on the website. So the problem was we had this people who, who built it in WordPress. It was a very old version. WordPress is still open source. Uh, but they had so many plugins, and they had something called a resource catalog, which was a proprietary plugin for 
WordPress built specifically for them, which nobody knew how, how it worked. Um, the number of people that actually logged in and tried to update the website was like three people. Um, and when I came in, I was, I was pushed in the position to do that. I mean, updating a blog post would take me about one and a half hours, and that's just because the WordPress instant was so slow. Um, there was no real documentation, so you had to really figure out how it worked. Um, to update a, a document, which was then given by the workgroup chair to me to upload on the website would take me also an hour. Um, and yeah, it, and it's not like I could write a script for this and, and do any of that because nobody knew how that would work. So this was, was the front end, which was already terrible. Um, there was a so-called forum which had like five people signed up 10 years ago and nobody ever looked at it. Um, so it wasn't very good. The back end was, was even worse. It was a proprietary tool called Causeway, which was a monolithic software and it had all the functionality. So yes, um, it had all the functionality, which is important to say because people were like, yeah, we're gonna migrate off this, but can we have all the functionality? How will we get all of these features in there? Um, so that's, that's a main problem. But the interesting part was because it was member specific and because the license model was per member, we could not have public people come in. So when I tried to convince the board of directors to migrate to the open source, initially got a little bit of backlash on the fact that will we have all these features? And then I said, yeah, but you can't anyway do the public working groups. So if you want the public working group, you need to migrate to something else. And then running two stacks or three stacks was too complicated, so we would try the new stack I had built up, well, I had designed, I didn't build it up at that point. Um, so yeah, why did we need this new system? We wanted a much better system from a technical point of view. We wanted the users to be able to interact on an easier way, so have a better design, um, and it available to members and non-members, like I said. Um, we wanted to introduce automation, so um, I don't want to get a zip file from my workgroup chair and upload that into WordPress. I mean, we did that maybe 20 years or 30 years ago. That's not very relevant today. Um, I wanted to embrace more of the DevOps mentality as in break down the silos between the working groups. So we have a lot of working groups, but they never used to communicate with each other, mostly because it was just too difficult in the tooling to do that. So you would have mailing lists and you would have messages or mailing lists crossing and it was very complex in place of just having cooperation between all of them. Um, and I wanted to give the work group chairs also more access and power to, to upload those documents. I mean, if they need a document uploaded, the only thing they need to do is upload, well, generate it, it goes into the automated pipeline, it needs my approval because I'm the TSC chair, it needs board of director approval, so we can do that in a Git flow and we can automate that process and get it on the website there directly. I don't need to worry about zip files or anything else. That should all be automated so that people can have time to do actual work and not be worried about all these administrative functions. Um, so yeah, I, I wanted to use the whole CI/CD pipeline concept and get that um, into the foundation. But I wanted to also go to a more modular system so that in case one functionality would not be available, I could actually swap that out and get a newer tool. Um, I would also be able to change, and you will see later that on several occasions I've already changed of tooling uh, because better tools were available or better tools were uh, I was made aware of, so it's, it would be good to change. Um, I wanted to run on power so that we can actually prove that this technology is not just something that can be built but that we can run a production load on. Um, like I said, we wanted to have components and I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So I was going to use open source projects. Um, I wanted to use them. I want to contribute back to them. I want to get other people involved in that uh, because in that way I have it much easier than trying to build something from scratch myself, which would one, take me too long. Two, would be too specific to my use case and I would, with a few minor changes, be able to reuse many of the open source projects already available. I wanted to run open source software on open source hardware. Uh, 
which didn't mean investing in, in hardware ourselves. Uh, we were already running a data center and, and doing that, so we, we added that on it. Um, we wanted to have data and privacy safe systems so that people actually know what data they are putting. Their privacy is being respected. Um, and we wanted to have interactions with other systems. And with other systems, I mean like if um, tomorrow we see that there's an interest of a specific project, we can link with that project. We can have the developer from that project easily communicate within the foundation without them having to go through hold a membership or with any, uh, any other type of platform. They can reuse their existing platform and basically create connections within our uh, foundation. And yeah, we wanted to be available where the developers are. So we don't want to push, pull developers into this. We want to go to their locations and actually find them online um, and connect with them. It makes it easier um, than us trying to, again, convince people to come to our platform. So I came up with this elaborate scheme, uh, which is very impressive as a, as a schema. Um, but the main point is basically, we had all of these components which would talk to each other, and we would have components that would talk to external systems like GitLab, like GitHub, uh, like Slack, because there are still a lot of people who like Slack, but also with IRC, so we are on Libera chat. Um, and so with, with all of this, we were able to build a platform that people could use very easily, and that people could use very easily. Yes? Is there a reason why you chose to uh, select IRC and not something more modern like Rocket Chat or um, I forgot the name? Well, I, I'll come back to that in a minute, if you give me a minute. Um, because you, you will see here, for instance, OPF Chat. OPF Chat is the Open Power Foundation chat system, which used to run Mattermost. Well, at present, it's still running Mattermost. Mattermost linked to Slack and Libera. Uh, that we are swapping out and migrating to Matrix. So that will happen uh, in January, which is why we wanted the modular system, uh, because in this case I could actually decide, I mean, at the time I thought uh, Mattermost would be the best solution. Um, we implemented, people use it, uh, but now we see that Matrix is a better solution, um, and so we are swapping that out. So yeah, I will maybe go to this one a bit easier. So we have what we call the passport, um, which is basically when a member uh, gets access, he gets an open LDAP account, um, and then we use Otelia um, to do single sign-on, which means that he can go to the website, click login, he logs in with his credentials, and he gets access to all the systems that he should get access. Uh, but because all of these systems are individual, any other non-member can also get access to them. Um, Front-end web, we use something very simple, Hugo. Um, so a static website builder, it's in Git. Um, it does require some of the marketing people to understand Git, and, and I know some of them have been very angry at me about that, uh, but I'm still surviving for now. Um, so I didn't like that a lot. Um, we actually have a tool now that they can prepare their blog post and get it into Git and they don't need to use a command line. So they are slightly more happy. Um, we had the idea on replicating the CNCF landscape. So I presume you know this huge website with a landscape in there. Um, and the Linux Foundation has open sourced that on GitHub. If you ever try to reproduce that and you succeed completely, please let me know. Uh, we tried doing that and we failed horribly, uh, which is why I built something in Hugo to do the, exactly the same thing. Um, but yeah, we, we failed there, so again, that is Hugo now for it. Um, so we have four landscapes uh, where you can actually see what works on power and, and how it works. The member portal, again, a static website, nothing complicated. Um, it's basically once you click on the front-end website, you go to the member portal, and then you get access to all your things. The minute meetings, which is the nice one for me, uh, means that a workgroup chair takes the minute meetings. Um, that's in an online tool where everybody in the meeting can contribute. Once the workgroup chair has finalized that, he adds that into Git. The Git uh, repository uh, 
uh, executes a pipeline which will update the Hugo website with the minute meetings and will send out an email to all the members of that work group. So that's also automated. The only thing they need to do is put that file in. We had again work group chairs that are not that technical in a software perspective. These are people who, who did, for instance, a lot of hardware development, but never actually did any software. Um, so we have again a, a more graphical experience for them. So they can basically go to the node system, go to Gitty, um, and inject that, and the pipeline is automated. Uh, so for them, it's also fairly easy. Uh, yeah, we email and Dovecot because we don't want to use like cloud, um, that's simple and old technology. Yes? I just have to ask why Sam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was an admin for two years and I failed my So that's my mistake. I, I love Sendmail. So I, 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 I use it everywhere where I can. <laughs> okay. okay. But that's personal choice. You could use Postfix also. Um, it's, it's what I know, it's what I have used for decades and I like it. So. <laughs> so then we have the discussion. So we, we had this forum in, in WordPress which nobody ever used, which was ridiculous. Uh, we went to discourse. Um, again, we chose that because we could do forum and mailing list and can have both of them. Um, so people can send an email if you prefer to send an email. People can respond on the forum. They can have their nice uh, uh, emoticons. They can have their... Uh, images, they can do whatever the hell they want. Um, and then OPF chat, which like I said is, well, at the moment is still Mattermost. Uh, we are migrating to Matrix. Um, and then we will also have the link with IRC and Slack. Um, so anything you say on Mattermost today comes on IRC. We have people on IRC interacting with people. Um, because a lot of the IBMers who are part of the foundation are on Slack. They are, they are required by company policy to be on Slack, so they know Slack. They don't know IRC, but they communicate with people who are on IRC who refuse to come on Slack. So. Just for you alone. Yes, just for me alone. <laughs> no, Luke also doesn't like it, but anyway. Um, so yeah, then we have uh, the meeting system, which is nothing exceptional, just Jitsi. Um, we are looking now that we are migrating to Matrix to actually have Jitsi linked with Matrix. So um, if you went to the virtual event of FOSDEM, you experienced the Jitsi and the Matrix. We're trying to replicate that idea, basically. So we're not reinventing the wheel again. We saw FOSDEM do this. We like the way they do it. So we are going to copy it. Cool. Yes. Um, and then we have uh, Kanban, which we use Wakan, which is for the project management. So you can see where everything is. Given that we have people from, from all continents, um, it's easier for them to interact with. Um, if tasks move, it sends an email automatically. It does all the follow-up. Um, so that's very simple. Uh, for files, we use Nextcloud. So we have the Nextcloud instance where people can just put files in it there. This can be the recording of the meeting. This could be presentations that they do or any other documents that need to be publicly available or even privately available. Um, it's all linked with LDAP, so if you are a member of the working group, you automatically get access. Um, that's important for the private and the members one. For the public, it's just you go to the website and you click and you see all the files. Then we have Git. Uh, so we have Gitty running in the back end. Um, we do have mirrors to Git Hub, and you'll see the double arrow because we actually do back and forth syncing with GitHub. Uh, and we do keep a copy on GitLab, so if people prefer GitLab and want to find us on GitLab, they can find us there. Uh, it does all point back to the Gitty, so you need to, at the end, if you really want to do a lot of work, you're better off uh, getting connection on Gitty. Um, and, and again, that view to the world that we are on GitHub, because that's important for some people, uh, but keeps all our data internal. So if tomorrow GitHub decides to, well, if Microsoft decides to kill GitHub, we can, we still have all the data available, and we don't need to rely on people's laptop for a copy of that. Uh, similar to uh, GitLab, um, so we actually have our own data available. Um, I mentioned, uh, FrameMaker, 
So a lot of documents were made in FrameMaker. After a long discussion, we finally uh, standardized on LaTeX. Um, so all documents are now made in LaTeX, which means that for the academic world, it's very easy. Um, for more of the scientific world, it was also very easy. Um, for some of the hardware designers, it was a, a shift. Uh, it took them a while to shift. Um, I mean, I can't blame them. Some of their documents are like 5,000 pages, so we need to be aware that this is a whole process. Um, but for some of them, LaTeX is too complicated. So what we did is there's a tool called Overleaf, which is a web front end to LaTeX. Um, and that we use for those people who are not very acquainted with this uh, tool, so they can actually type and it generates LaTeX and then puts it in the Git repository. Um, and in this way, people who are non-technical can also contribute to these things. Um, and then, like you heard this morning already, Mastodon is becoming very popular. Um, so we are starting our own one. Um, this will be linked with LDAP, so if you're a member, you automatically get an account. Uh, but it also means that we can federate messages, we can interact with other people, uh, and whole the activity pub is basically available to us. Um, then I mentioned note taking. So note taking is done in Hedgedoc, which is a, a collaborative markdown tool, um, which means that if I am in my note, I can actually just copy paste the link to you, um, and you can join in and type and help out taking notes. But this is not just for notes, you could do that for any type of markdown. Um, we then have request tracker because we have a whole bunch of requests that come in or uh, people who need to have information. Uh, so all the contact forms on the website go through request tracker and then they get processed from there. Uh, for the CICD pipeline, we have three pipelines for the moment. We have the woodpecker, which is for most of the document uh, processing. We have Jenkins because of the hardware testing. So some of the code that needs to run on hardware um, was just built with Jenkins, so we kept that. No need to reinvent anything here. And we have Concur for some of the more uh, advanced software stacks uh, because it needs to be able to communicate with different parts and different uh, areas. Uh, we then have our own registration system, um, Pretix or Pre-Reg now, um, and that's for registration of events, for registration of any other type of things. Um, we have our own CFP tool, so Pretox, uh, and we have Helfer tool, which is more for the volunteer slash project management. So if we have, let's say, a student who wants to volunteer help out on something, we can use Helfer tool as a project manager to manage that person. Um, so yeah, those are all the toolings. Um, now, you should build your own stack. Um, now, this is run, should you build it? or should you just run it uh, or get it run by someone? That's a choice you need to make. Not all of the sources in the world are evil, um, but you need to make your choices wisely. And it is always a choice that you need to make. So there is no perfect solution here. Um, but you need to know what you choose. The most important thing is your data is your data. You need to be able to get access to your data. Many of the SaaS providers lure you in and once they have your data, it becomes data back out of there. By using open source tooling, we have our data. We can back this up, we can do whatever we want with it. We can even transform that data to a new platform. So for Mattermost, we will extract the data and put it into Matrix. So we have all the history there. We could not do that if we were doing Slack or anything else. Um, so we, we can do these things. You can run real multi or hybrid cloud setups because you, you don't need to choose one provider. You can choose multiple providers. And what, what are we trying to achieve with this? We are also trying to achieve that more providers. So within the foundation, I started this project, but we have other companies who are helping out on this. Um, the idea is that you would always be able to run this yourself. So if you don't like the provider anymore, you can put it on your home server or you could choose another provider. Um, and that's why the user needs to maintain data ownership. And, and that is very important. Um, but at the same time, security also needs to be maintained. So some of the things might not always be as open as in publicly available, but should be available to you as a customer. 
So, and that was my presentation. Yes. Do you run Paul? Yes. Everything. Uh, everything except Jitsi. We are still uh, in the process of porting Jitsi to Power. With the exception of that one function, yes, everything I mentioned. So all of the, the two part component slide, everything with exception of Jitsi runs on Power. And we are in the process of... And you have multiple providers that provide you Power platform. Uh, we run our own Power data centers. So we, we have two data centers and we have um, 12, yeah, so six and six, so 12 power nodes um, where we run everything. We can do the firmware updates ourselves, which we have done. Um, and for, for instance, for FreeBSD, there's a bug in the upstream IBM firmware. We actually fixed that, well, FreeBSD fixed that, we tested that, we were able to flash the firmware, we were able to do everything with that. So yes, we do that, which is why we're looking for providers that also have the ability to do this. So yeah. We can talk maybe afterwards more. Uh, yes, Marcel? Uh, how do you look at the balance between um, doing everything yourself and buying stuff off the shelf? Because this will require a lot of maintenance, uh, effort, etc., etc., et to keep it running. So in, in my case, I'm, I'm, I'm used to doing this. One, because we have infrastructure as code, but we also now do uh, the application configuration in our code. So with the exception of the actual data, everything else is fairly easy. So migrating from this course to, from a version is basically just changing the tested version in our production environment. Um, also, um, so of most of these components, they are, we, we have the playbooks and because we use Ansible, we have the playbooks that automate all the updates. Um, so there, from our perspective, there's not a lot of maintenance because we know how to do this. If you, and that's the reason why I said we need more providers because we have done this for our use case. I am sure that if somebody else does this, they will come to other problems and we need to figure out those things which we haven't thought of or other people haven't thought of. So there are always the unknown unknowns that we need to learn about. Yes. How is the power usage versus performance ratio of the uh, processor you're using now compared to AMD, Intel? Uh, uh, it's sorry. The performance per watt. Yeah, the performance per watt. Yeah. So let's say if you run 1,024 VMs on a Power 9, your power consumption is about 200 watts for the entire system, uh, which. If you do that same thing on an Intel one, if you are able to find any Intel machine that can do that, I'm sure you'll be more than 200 watts. So the performance per watt is not the issue. The issue is the availability of these machines. And that is why I still say this is a problem. And because I'm in the foundation, I'm working on that, making a machines more available. The cheapest machine you can buy today is 5,000 euros, which is acceptable. It isn't cheap, it isn't expensive, but getting Yeah, exactly, one. <laughs> Which is why I say that, see, this is, it's not a performance problem, it's an availability problem. And we are working on that. It will take us time. I'm not saying we have that solved directly. Yes? But do you have that time? Because uh, risk fee is uh, the so, upcoming case, and power is completely gone from the spectrum. RISC-V is indeed the upcoming kid and the upcoming kid by the time it will be a teenager will kill itself from an open source perspective. It isn't open source, it only has the illusion of being open source. With exception of the ISA, everything around it, the whole ecosystem is closed. You will not find an open source machine of RISC-V. And even worse, People, who, oh, well, not people, companies that are using RISC-V are now implementing it in a closed source version. They use binary blobs all over the place. This is not going to be any different than ARM. If you have an open solution, at this moment, open power is the only one. I'm not saying it will remain like that. There might be, RISC-V might do a complete U-turn, but at this point, that's not the case. And once that people will hit that limit, that's going to be a problem. And LibreSoc, 
uh, the NL net funded project actually started with risk five. They hit that wall and they pivoted to open power. And they are now building open power designed machinery. So I am convinced that risk five is not a, a threat. There might be other threats, I'm not denying that. Mm -hmm. And yes, we need to be quicker in what we do. We are being very slow. Okay. Thank you.